Um, right, so I'm going to give a couple of lectures here on um, so subcontinental lithospheric mantle. We're actually going to start with a bit of oceanic stuff just because it's easier to understand. And hopefully some of the concepts from that will help you understand the next couple of lectures when we talk about continental stuff. Um, I'm Pedro Waterton. I'm a postdoc. I work with Chris Silas, mainly on uh, Archean rocks from West Greenland. Um, I don't speak Danish. I've been trying to learn, but it's, it's brutal. So I'm just going to apologize for that right up. Um, OK, so what we're going to cover in the uh, today and Wednesday is um, what is the lithosphere and what is lithospheric mantle. Uh, we're going to talk about the nature of mantle samples and what different samples we can use to study um, the lithosphere. How is oceanic lithosphere formed on the modern Earth? Um, some differences between oceanic, con uh, modern continental and ancient or cratonic lithosphere. We'll talk about how continental lithosphere forms in the modern Earth. Um, a little bit about mantle metasomatism. Something uh, about lithosphere-derived melts. I sh should probably, basically just kimberlites. They're not really lithosphere-derived, but I had it messed up when I wrote this. And uh, some specifics about cratonic lithosphere and how it formed in the ancient Earth. What I hope you'll get from these lectures is an understanding of geochemical tools for studying the mantle, um, an understanding of the concept of mantle depletion and re-enrichment and what we can use to assess that, um, using PGs and rhenium osmium for investigating depleted mantle samples, and maybe learning that some of the stuff that Robert taught you was wrong. And um, we'll have a little bit of a think about how to read academic papers. All right. So in this first lecture, I'm going to cover some definitions for lithosphere, talk about mantle samples, uh, including opiolites, abyssal prototypes, orogenic prototypes, and xenoliths. And then I'll talk about how oceanic lithosphere is formed in the modern Earth, uh, starting with some simple models of how you form it and some complicating issues, particularly um, the presence of ultra depleted mantle residues in young, young lithosphere. So, what is the lithosphere? Um, you'll see a few different definitions for it, and they're sort of overlapping, they can be conflicting a bit. So um, I've just put, pasted in three from different papers here. Uh, the first one is the strong outer layer of Earth that comprises mobile tectonic plates and includes both the crust and uppermost mantle. And so this is a definition based on strength. And you can think of this as a mechanical definition of the lithosphere. So it's the strong outer skin of the Earth. Um, the one below defines it as the cold boundary layer near the Earth's surface, the part of the mantle that forms rigid plates within which heat is transported by conduction. So this is a thermal definition based on the fact that it is cold and heat is transported by con conduction rather than convection in the asthenosphere. And the third one at the bottom, dehydrated and melt depleted boundary layers, chemically buoyant enough that they do not partake in secondary convection. And this, by secondary convection, they mean smaller scale convection cycles than the broad plate tectonic cycle of subduction. Um, so this is a chemical definition that it's basically depleted and, and buoyant because it's been depleted. OK, so um, this slide just gives an illustration of what that might look like, talking about uh, oceanic lithosphere. So in this case, the thermal lithosphere is defined by an isotherm. So by the mid-ocean ridge, which is near the uh, vertical axis on the left, um, the hot mantle is coming all the way very close to the surface. So the thermal lithosphere is, um, is very thin because the asthenosphere is basically reaching up to the base of the crust. As the um, crust spreads away from the ridge and cools, the thermal lithosphere will thicken over time. And um, yeah, basically here it's just drawn by the 1300 degree C isotherm. I just pulled that one out of the air. Um, different people define it in different ways. The chemical lithosphere would be the part which has had melt extracted. Um, so this would be anything that was depleted at the mid-ocean ridge. So the thickness of the chemical lithosphere is going to be uh, the same throughout. It's uh, Once it's depleted, it's depleted. Um, the mechanical is um, the mechanical definition here is the more uh, rigid or more viscous um, part of the mantle. And so here I've just drawn the boundary in at where it stops um, decreasing in viscosity and starts to increase. And there is some overlap because basically the rigid part of the lithosphere is being defined here by the bit is, that is more depleted and colder. So it's some sort of combination of thermal and chemical properties. Little side note here, the mantle is a solid. Um, hopefully you've covered this in your geophysics courses. Um, but it can flow through creep. And this is a movement of dislocations or imperfections in crystals or along grain boundaries. Um, the viscosity of the asthenosphere is very, very high. Um, and this 10 to the 20 uh, pascal seconds 
heard is similar to piano wire, so you know, it's very, very viscous. Um, but because the time scales and length scales that we're dealing with, the mantle is so big and we're dealing with geological time, it can actually flow. So um, it's slightly analogous, uh, analogous to the uh, pitch drop experiment, which are these uh, experiments where people leave a very viscous liquid like bitumen and you leave it for 100 years or so. Um, this one, I think, is in Australia and it just dripped for the first time a few years ago and this is a big deal. Um, there's, the slight difference is that these are, are solids to forming by creep, whereas pitch is just a very, very viscous liquid. So the lithosphere is more viscous than the asthenosphere, but it's not necessarily behaving in an elastic manner throughout. You can see this on the diagram at the bottom, where um, I've, uh, you can see a plot of intraplate earthquake depths and the effective elastic thickness, which is calculated, imagining that it's a, plate, a, a, a plank, basically, that's bending, and you can do a calculation of how thick the rigid part is. So you can see that actually only the, only the uppermost part of oceanic lithosphere here is actually behaving elastically. So on the whole, it's strong because it's viscous, not because it's um, elastic. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so the main point is that the lithosphere is a cool, strong, and chemically buoyant outer layer of the Earth, it includes the crust and the uppermost mantle, and heat is transported mainly by conduction. You get slightly different definitions based on mechanical strength, temperature, and chemical depletion. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, talk about mantle samples that we can use to study the lithosphere. Um, I just put this in, I, I, I'm assuming you're all familiar with it, but um, just to remind you, different types of mantle rocks. Um, we're basically splitting them into peridotites, which are olivine dominated rocks and everything else. Um, so lertzolites are olivine plus OPX plus orthoperoxine plus clinoperoxine or CPX and some sort of aluminous phase. This varies depending on the depth. At shallow depths, you'll get plagioclase. Intermediate depths, you get an aluminum spinel, and about past 90 kilometers or so, you start to get garnet. Um, this is basically what fertile or unmelted asthenosphere tends to look like. Uh, next, we have Hartsbergites, which are olivine and OPX. These are generally depleted melt residues. Um, a lot of the lithosphere ends up being Hartsbergitic or you know, some sort of Hartsbergite, maybe with a little bit of um, clinoproxene and, and garnet or something like that. And finally, donites, which are pure olivine um, rocks. Now, these are either extremely depleted melt residues, so you melt until you've got rid of everything else except for olivine, or they can be they can represent melt channels, um, which form by reactive dissolution of orthoperoxine. In the other category, uh, we've got pyroxenites. This includes um, Websterite, which I think is a mixed orthoperoxine and clinoproxene rock. Um, orthoproxenite or clinoproxenite, which are more pure end members of either type of pyroxene. Um, these may represent chunks of recycled crust or potentially uh, reactions between melts from a recycled bit of crust like an eclogite and a peridotite. Um, eclogites are garnet and omphacitic uh, clinoproxene. So these are the very, very high pressure form of a um, basaltic composition, a metamorphic rock. And these are uh, generally thought to represent recycled oceanic crust or basalt that got trapped and crystallized at depth. Uh, finally, chromatites are basically pure chromite, and these are often associated with dunites, so they're related to these melt channels I mentioned with the dunites. Okay. So this um, sort of flow diagram is just trying to show what different types of, um, well, first mass samples and then uh, methods that we can use to uh, investigate the lithosphere. So on the right are geophysical methods, and this isn't a geophysics course, so I'm not really going to talk much about them, but we will reference them um, from time to time. Um, and so the nice thing about geophysical methods is they give you wide scale, like average properties. You can get some physical information, like the temperature, the thermal state of the lithosphere, uh, things like conductivity and um, mineral alignments, anisotropy. Um, and by comparing these things to what we know about rocks in the lab, then you can try and draw out some of the chemical properties of the lithosphere. Um, in terms of mantle samples, uh, we're mainly going to be using geochemistry to investigate them. Um, from continental crust, you can get uh, xenolith samples in alkali basalts. These tend to be off craton, we'll talk about cratons later, um, so in younger lithosphere. Um, on cratons or older 
um, up through, you know, erupting through older crust or thicker liths, they tend to get kimberlites or lamproites. Um, there are some subduction zone xenoliths, although apparently, well, I'm not really going to talk about them. Um, and finally, orogenic prototypes. I put a question mark here because there's a bit of a dispute as to what orogenic prototypes actually represent. In terms of oceanic lithosphere, uh, the main things we can study are ophiolites and abyssal prototypes. There are also oceanic xenoliths, but they only occur where you get some fairly rare lavas, so I'm not going to talk about those much. So in green are just the, the things we're going to be focusing on in this course. Some pros and cons of uh, geophysics versus geochemical methods. So obviously ge geophysical methods, we can cover vast areas uh, and we can get average properties of uh, you know, representative big chunks of mantle. The problem is you don't have great um, spatial resolution. So um, I just put a, a figure here from Priestley and McKenzie and you can see that maybe anything less than a few hundred kilometers across, you're not really resolving. We can see these broad curves. It's a plot of um, lithospheric thickness. Um, it's also, it can be a little difficult to disentangle different effects, such as um, there are trade-offs between temperature and composition if you're using seismic velocities. So obviously, if we do direct sampling and use a bunch of geochemistry, we can go and measure the exact composition of a chunk of mantle. Um, and we can use, you know, we can have a guess at the age of it. There's a couple of methods that we'll talk about. The problem is uh, the coverage is pretty poor. Um, you can see again on the same figure in the same area that you can just cover with a vast geophys geophysical survey. There's only a few um, kimberlite occurrences which bring up xenoliths and allow you to sample the mantle directly. So there's pretty poor coverage. Um, there is probably some sampling bias. We need to ask ourselves why mantle samples are being brought up where they are and whether that only happens in unrepresentative mantle. Or through. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. So um, it's just a, it's a plot of uh, the lithospheric thickness, and this is determined by like surface size, seismic waves. Um, so basically, in the black outline, you can see the outline of Greenland and North America. Um, areas in red are thin lithosphere. So this, I think this particular method has pretty bad sensitivity below about 100 kilometers. So it's, it's, it's thin, but you know, not exactly sure how thin. And the areas in blue are thick lithosphere. So you can see here that it's probably getting up to about 200, 220 kilometers thick. Um, but the different, uh, the, the contours between the red and the blue are, um, they're quite like broad, I guess. Like you're not getting a, a very good like resolution. Like I can't see if one bit of lithosphere 20 kilometers away from another bit has a different thickness or not. I'm just gonna get some sort of average between them. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so just talking about some of these mantle samples. Um, in terms of oceanic lithosphere, probably the, the, um, some of the better ones to understand are ophiolites. Uh, these are tectonically in place slices of oceanic lithosphere. Um, on the right here is just a cross section, uh, sort of a schematic cross section through a subduction related ophiolite. So you can see at the bottom in the green circle, uh, we have a little slice of upper mantle that came up with the oceanic crust. And above it, there's all sorts of layered ultramafic, sheeted dike complexes, lavas, and then at the top, some sediments. So the good thing about ophiolites is that they are, they can be very large, and sometimes we get really well-preserved structural relationships. So we can actually see what's where the different rock types in the mantle are with respect to one another. Um, we can see features like melt channels and some chromatites. The potential problem with ophiolites is that uh, they might be biased because it's actually quite difficult to abduct oceanic crust, the vast majority just ends up getting subducted. And um, there's a possibility that subduction related crust is overrepresented. So in the, in the left figure there, you can see kind of the easiest way to envisage an ophiolite um, being abducted is where you have uh, oceanic oceanic sub subduction. And eventually the overriding plate catches up with the continent and some of the crust and upper oceanic lithospheric mantle gets scraped off onto the continent. We also have abyssal prototypes. Um, these may be tectonically in place, or they might be in situ. And um, generally, these are just dredged from the ocean floor. You can, um, there have been some um, 
studies where they've sent down submersibles, so you get a little bit more context, but you really can't get a lot of rock that way, and it's very expensive. So a lot of these are just like dropping a bucket on a kilometer long or many kilometer long cable, dragging it along the seafloor and seeing what you turf up. So you have very, very little context. Um, there, is also, there are also some oceanic drilling projects, which obviously give you a bit more context. You'll get a vertical section through the um, crust and uppermost mantle there, but they're, again, more expensive. There's not been so many of them. Um, what we see with these is uh, a mix of residual pruritites and some refertilized pruritites, and they're often strongly hydrothermally altered from being emplaced on the ocean floor. Um, on the left image here uh, from Carson 1998, it's just a, a view out of a submersible. So just to give you an idea, you get some context, but maybe not so much. Um, just got a little light. And this is a, a fault scarp. So there's a, a fault off to the right where you can see that kind of craggy looking thing. Uh, and then on the right is a, just a couple of images of abyssal prototypes. There's a residual prototype and a prototype with some gabbro veins in it, which has uh, been refertilized by some melt passing through. In terms of continental lithospheric mantle samples, um, one thing we can look at is orogenic prototypes. These are tectonically in place. Um, as I mentioned, I had a question mark by them before. There are some people who think these are actually slices of a stenosphere rather than lithosphere. So in that case, they're not very useful to us. But I think the consensus is that they are probably chunks of uh, continental lithosphere. Um, so the little slices, chunks of mantle in um, mountain belts, you, they're generally not attached to basaltic crust like we'd seen in ophiolites. Um, there's two main types, which I didn't know until I started putting this lecture together, but um, you can either get fault bounded blocks, which is there's a picture on the right where some serpentinized mantle has been thrust over some crustal rocks. Um, and you can also find them as brecciated class in sediments. Um, and there's a picture here from Le Gabriel et al. 2010, which is quite an interesting read if you want to figure out how you get chunks of mantle into a sedimentary rock. These tend to be pretty metamorphosed and altered. As I mentioned, there's a bit of uncertainty about the tectonic setting. Um, another big source of information about the continental lithospheric mantle is from xenoliths. These are volcanically in place. So essentially a little chunk of mantle that gets ripped up with some magma and ends up erupting in a, in a lava. The problem with these is they're point samples. So we basically have a vertical and maybe a bit random section of mantle that we've, um, that we've sampled. Um, you have no geological context whatsoever. You can figure out um, what depth they came from, uh, usually using thermobarometry and seeing at what pressure and temperature they equilibrated, um, but that's about it. Um, off cratons, so in, in younger continental lithosphere, tends to be, uh, these tend to be found in alkali basalts and related rocks. These can be pretty well preserved. A lot of them are spinel, lertzolites, or hartsbergites, and these are so shallow, depleted melt residues. Um, on craton, uh, our main source of xenoliths is from kimberlites. Um, these tend to be pretty altered. Kimberlites are very reactive and they will um, react with the xenoliths that they're carrying and you get kimberlite infiltration along cr cracks and stuff. So that can make it, it can mask some of the geochemical signatures. A lot of these are uh, garnet peridotites and eclogites, um, which are interpreted as deep residues of melting and um, metamorphosed uh, mafic rocks. You get a pretty variable size, like some of these are just down to like a little centimeter chunk. Some of them can be, I, th I think the biggest are up to about a meter across, which is pretty massive for a xenolith. Okay, so we can use ophiolites and abyssal prototypes to study oceanic lithosphere, and orogenic prototypes and xenoliths and alkali basalts or kimberlites study continental lithosphere. Most of these are limited to one type of lithosphere, oceanic, continental, and on or off craton, younger old lithosphere. And a lot of them suffer from uh, limitations in terms of being altered, uh, potential sampling bias, and coverage. Does anyone have any questions in this section? OK, so I'll talk a bit about how oceanic lithosphere forms. Um, this is also something that I hope you've covered in earlier courses. Um, so this is a basic. Um, spreading model for oceanic lithosphere uh, formation. So in this model, two oceanic plates are slowly separating. This causes passive upwelling, um, which means that you get hot asthenosphere decompressing to very shallow depths. And melting basically occurs in a triangular region, 
The uh, interesting thing with this model is that it predicts that you should have pretty much constant oceanic crustal thickness for almost any spreading rate, because essentially the faster you're pulling it apart, there's not as much time for more magma to get up there before it's being pulled away. So you, it kind of cancels out the fact that you might be generating more magma in a given amount of time. Um, as you have uh, upwelling, the most intense melting and the most depleted uh, mantle samples should be at the apex of the melting region, so right at the top underneath the crust, that's where you should have the most depletion. Um, by contrast, near the base, you're only getting a little bit of upwelling, a little bit of melting, so the mantle shouldn't be quite as depleted. And in this case, the chemical lithospheric thickness will be approximately the same as the base of the melting region. So in this um, model on the left from Ito and Dunn, that corresponds to depth of about 60 kilometers or so. And on the right, um, it's just a, a very simple, simplified conceptual idea of what a triangular melting region might look like. Okay, so we can compare that model to oceanic mantle samples. Um, in terms of um, what we see in ophiolites and abyssal peridotites, the majority are depleted Hartsbergite melt residues, so that kind of chimes with what we expect. Um, about 71% of abyssal peridotites are Hartsbergitic, and a lot of um, ophiolitic mantle is also Hartsbergite. So overall, we're seeing pretty broad agreement with that model. Um, but in, in detail, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We don't just see depleted Hartsbergites, we also see Dunites, uh, which are interpreted to represent uh, melt flow channels. We can tell these are melt flow channels and not ultra depleted um, residues because they have quite high rare earth element concentrations that look pretty similar to mid ocean ridge basalts. Uh, you also see some re fertilized peridotites, which uh, maybe have a little bit of uh, melt that's been flowing through trapped in them. We see some pyroxenites. Uh, there's a bit of debate on what this actually means whether these are little chunks of recycled oceanic crust or some sort of uh, crystallized melt that got stuck at depth. So in detail, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than these simple models. On the right here is just an image from uh, Kellerman et 1995, and it's just a schematic uh, section of the Oman Ophiolite. Um, you can see the lower crustal gabbros at the top, uh, some dunite, which probably represents ultramafic cumulates formed at the bottom of the oceanic crust. But then the majority of this gray banded stuff is uh, Hartsbergite, and then this is uh, dunite channels, which are probably these melt channels coming through and uh, reacting away um, orthoperoxine. So um, I'm just going to talk about uh, the uh, an ultra slow spreading ridge, the Gackle Ridge, which is up in the Arctic Ocean. And um, the interesting thing here is once you get down to really, really slow spreading rates, then the conductive cooling uh, from hydrothermal uh, from um, seawater above and also hydrothermal circulation into the top of the uh, mid-ocean ridge actually suppresses uh, magnetism. So if you look at the diagram at the bottom left, um, you can see it's a, it's a plot of the seismic crustal thickness against the spreading rate. And for most spreading rates between about 20 millimeters per year and 140, we're getting a more or less constant crustal thickness. It's somewhere in the region of six to eight kilometers. Once you get down to these really, really uh, slow spreading rates, then the seismic crustal thickness is, is very low, uh, less than three kilometers, a couple of places. There's essentially no crust. We just have mantle exposed to the surface. So uh, hydrothermal circulation and conductive cooling has suppressed magnetism to the point where mantle is just upwelling. It's not, it's not getting a chance to melt, and then it's just being pulled apart by the spreading. So the prediction here is that we should be able to see you know, a stenosphere or what's being fed into mid-ocean ridges normally. Um, this is mainly talking about um, a study by Derrico et al. 2016, and so these are abyssal uh, peridotite sam samples. Um, the mantle samples are actually a mix of depleted lertzolites and Hartsbergites. So um, the bulk rock and mineral data are both consistent with very large degrees, degrees of depletion. There's very low uh, bulk rock aluminium and um, spinels that are highly enriched in chromium over aluminium. This is having a high uh, CR number. And they have strongly depleted light rare earth elements in minerals like clinoproxene. So the top plot there, um, you can see uh, depleted more mantle. This is what we think the circulating asthenosphere would look like in the white star. And then the samples that they analyzed, hearts we got in blue, lots of light in green. And you can see this uh, depletion trend towards very low aluminium and very high uh, spinel chromium numbers. 
Um, the one uh, beneath are clinoproxenes and the rare earth elements. And again, you can see that these um, clinoproxene compositions are much more depleted than you'd expect for depleted mold mantle. So based on these, they came up with um, these compositions representing about 6 to 13% melt extraction. So these are quite depleted. And if you have this much melting at a mid-ocean ridge, you said it should have uh, oceanic crust in the region of 7 to 14 kilometers thick. We already said there's no crust here. So this depletion must have occurred way before these things were dragged up into the Gakko Ridge. Um, and some rhenium osmium studies on these um, peridotites show that there's mantle model ages actually up to 2 billion years old. So there's actually chunks of mantle being dragged into the ridge that were ancient and depleted way, way before the ridge actually formed. Um, I'm just going to do a little recap of using rhenium osmium model ages for mantle samples. I think Robert should have covered this, um, but we'll, we'll go through it again. Um, so basically, rhenium-187 undergoes a beta decay to osmium-187. It's got a um, half-life of about 41.6 billion years, so it's pretty useful for studying processes on the timescales of the Earth, which is 4.5 billion years. Um, rhenium and, osmi and osmium are fractionated during mantle melting and also during crystal fractionation processes. In general, rhenium is more incompatible than osmium. I will get into this in a bit more detail in the next lecture. Um, so the mantle in general has pretty low rhenium over osmium ratios and it evolves to an unradiogenic osmium composition. So because it's less rhenium, less rhenium 187 decay, so we have low 187 osmium. Um, Mantle melts and crustal samples have much higher rhenium over osmium because the rhenium is more incompatible. And these evolve to highly radiogenic uh, osmium compositions. So you can just see on the right is, is a kind of a schematic plot of this. The DM and PUM are um, primitive mantle and depleted mantle uh, evolution curves. So um, this is you know, based on the rhenium osmium ratio that we think the mantle has. So if at some point in the distant past, there was a depletion event, you largely remove the rhenium, and basically the osmium um, isotope composition then gets locked in. So we can calculate two different types of ages, um, I think this is on here, yeah, by projecting them back to this mantle evolution curve. The first one is TRD, or time of rhenium depletion, and this one assumes there's no rhenium whatsoever left in it. It seems a, a, a little odd, but um, it's actually very useful because it gives us a very robust minimum age. The current day 187 osmium cannot be any lower, uh, sorry, the ancient 187 osmium cannot have been any lower than it is at the present day, right? You can't dissolve 187 osmium once you've made it. The TMA um, is a model age, and so in that one we use the rhenium osmium ratio to project it back to that mantle curve. Um, obviously, in an ideal situation, that would be a more accurate representation of the age, because if there's anything above zero rhenium, then we're going to have to correct for rhenium decay. The problem with using this is that uh, rhenium tends to be a bit more mobile, and it can be messed around with by metasomatism. So um, sometimes we'll get fairly meaningless uh, model ages, like you can get ages which are older than the Earth, which is obviously not possible. Um, okay. So if you have a very depleted sample where all of the rhenium has been removed by melting and there's no later rhenium addition or mobility, then the TRD is equivalent to the TMA. So on this plot um, for mantle samples, you can see um, where it says R1. Have I got a pointer? Not that works. No. Um, from R1, if we were doing a TRD age, it's, uh, you just project it horizontally back until it hits the curve, and that's the rhenium depletion age. Uh, for a TMA age, you use the rhenium-osmium ratio, so samples with a higher rhenium-osmium ratio will make a steeper projection on that plot, and you project it back until it hits the mantle curve. For crustal, crustal samples, you can only use TMA because they have more radiogenic osmium than the mantle. Just talk about another case study of um, recent oceanic lithosphere formation. Um, this is about the, the Narlin ophiolite. Most of this is taken from Lolly et al. 2020. And um, this is an ophiolite up in the northwestern part of Canada in this, by this beautiful little town called Atlin, which I went to on holiday once. Um, 
It's a pretty messed up ophiolite. It's been chopped up into chunks. There's missing crustal sections. And it was probably abducted in the um, Permian or Triassic about 250 million years ago. Again, the majority of it is depleted Hartsburgite, um, but it's cut by donites, uh, sometimes with chromatites associated with them, and pyroxenites. In the uh, top right picture there, you can see that there's, some, uh, there's a donite channel cutting through the Hartsburgites. Uh, bottom left are some big um, metasomatic or refertilized um, that have been um, that have grown in the depleted rocks next to an orthoproxenite vein. And at the bottom right, there's some of these uh, websterites, so orthoproxene, clinoproxene um, rocks cutting the Hartsburgite as channels. In terms of um, the osmium isotopes, I've just drawn this in the same way as the, as the previous plot, so we can, can work through it again. Um, they vary from um, being much less radiogenic than the mantle at 250 million years ago to much, much more radiogenic. So just looking at the, the most depleted one, so the one with the lowest 187 over 188 osmium, to do a TRD age of that, we project it backwards, and we actually get a TRD age of about 2 billion years old. So again, seeing evidence of very, very old mantle um, being incorporated into this young oceanic lithosphere. The extremely radiogenic ones give you these uh, meaningless future ages, because if you draw a horizontal line to hit the mantle curve, then you have to go the wrong way. So this, um, it's still a minimum age. We know it's older than the future, but it's not very useful. It's mainly just telling us that um, the rhenium has been really messed up um, after these rocks formed. So it's not just a problem with not correcting for the present day rhenium. Some of the uh, TMA ages, we still get future ages. So this is, uh, yeah, this tells us that rhenium must have been mobilized after um, it was initially, uh, the rocks were initially depleted. Converting these into TRD ages, you can see there's a big peak about 250 million years ago. And this makes sense. So our, our oceanic lithosphere probably formed shortly before it was abducted onto the continents. But the TRD ages as old as 2 billion years old uh, needs some involvement of older depleted mantle in the formation of this oceanic lithosphere. This is also supported by some lead isotope work that um, gives similar ancient depletion ages. And the future TRD and TM ages uh, represent disturbance of the rhenium osmium system during refertilization. So this is rhenium mobility or possibly addition of 187 osmium. And so what we're seeing in the isotopes is actually quite similar to what we see in the bulk rocks. The majority are these depleted Hartsburgites, but there's been all this melt flow afterwards that has um, screwed things around, changed compositions and enriched our rhenium osmium. Okay. This is just a kind of summary uh, figure from Leotel. 2008. So in general, our model of forming oceanic lithosphere works. Um, upwelling a ridge, depletion, great. But on top of that, we um, are dragging chunks of potentially enriched and depleted refractory mantle, which is stuck within the asthenosphere. And some of these are going to get incorporated into the uh, lithosphere. The difference is that the enriched bits uh, melt more easily. So these show up in uh, morbs or um, uh, in magmas forming at the mid-ocean ridge. But the refractory, the really old depleted stuff, doesn't melt very easily at all. So we actually don't see any evidence of it in the lavas. We can only see it um, by going and looking at these mantle samples. Okay. So just to finish up, um, oceanic lithosphere is the simplest thing to understand, should I have started with it. it mainly consists of mantle that was depleted during mid-ocean ridge melting. However, there is evidence that older depleted mantle is incorporated into young oceanic lithosphere, and the oceanic lithosphere is refertilized after its formation. You can use rhenium osmium ages to investigate mantle depletion events and refertilization. Does anyone have any questions about all that? Okay, fantastic. Um, I think that's it. Uh, references are at the end if you guys are bored. Uh,